Thank you all for coming today. Um, really important for me because um, part of my role is accountability. It's a um, large, large part of my role. And it's really important I have the right people around the table um, to give me the information that I need in order to be able to uh, be questioned by the public on the services that the police is, is offering. So in order to make this meeting for me uh, meaningful and effective, um, I really appreciate the fact that you could probably adjust to some of your diaries and stuff to, to be here. Um, it is, um, it is um, recognised um, and it's really important that you are here. Okay. Uh, and obviously going forward, um, I'd really like that to be a priority for you, that you come here and, and we have these conversations if indeed you are required to be here. So uh, really appreciate that. So uh, that being said, uh, welcome to everybody. Um, this is my first meeting, so uh, it's new ground for me a little bit, um, and um, hopefully we can get through as painless as possible. Um, I don't know that there are any apologies. Have we had any apologies? No. Not? Okay, oh, Mark. Mark's on uh, yeah, that. David, got Danny. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. There, was, there was a question of whether uh, we're expecting Claire Salter or not. Claire's not here today, okay, so fine. I'm with right. yeah. All right, fine. Okay, we'll be. Okay, um, so first item on the agenda is just quickly to go through the actions of the previous meeting. Um, so I'll just quickly run through them and if we can all agree that they uh, are accurate and correct. Um, action number one is uh, tw 2024 to 2028, um, forced to provide representative, representative from the U Youth Intervention Section to attend the Chief's Executive upcoming meeting with the City and County Youth Justice service forced to liaise with Sandra. Meeting is not yet convened. Is there any update on that? No further update, no. I'm still working on that one. You're still working yeah. on that one. Okay, lovely. Okay. Uh, 24 to 20, 2000, uh, uh, 2029, the Chief to share a copy of the Rural Crime Delivery Plan. That's been received yep. on apparently the 24th of April 24, is that correct? Yes. Lovely. Uh, forced to share results of Ops Soteria uh, due late April to be confirmed. So, Operation Soteria, so we are an, an adopter force, so we're not one of the pilot forces, so we're yeah. in the process now of following some of the key delivery dates. We've completed a self-assessment earlier this year, and as a consequence, we're now uh, completing our transformational plan, and this is the element that we have to do before we can then start um, Operation Soteria in, in earnest. So the transformational plan draft has been provided. We're now um, expecting a national feedback on that on the 17th of June. Yeah. Um, and then following that, um, it'll come through to a uh, chief officer for, uh, for us to look at, and then we will be ready to uh, begin with the plan. Um, so at the moment, we're still sort of working through the process. Of re we're in line with all the timelines and yeah. that we've been given, met all the deadlines. Um, but f suffice to say that it'll take a while to, for us to start to see any impact around Operation Soteria. There's a clear governance structure in relation to it with a, a Rob Griffin as the ACC leading uh, the gold. We've got um, the head of PP is the strategic information implementation lead, and then we've got six pillar lead, six separate pillars, all with their own leads as well. Okay, lovely. so it's all in it's all in the process, and that we're working through that. Okay, do we have a, a sort of date when all of that we think all of that will be completed? The final uh, the visit in relation to them reviewing our transformational plan is in July. Okay, so I guess uh, sort of uh, August September we'll be looking to uh, begin that work. It's also relying on a. Uh, National Operator Model Implementation Plan that's been worked on, so that also needs to be finished, but that's obviously if something's been delivered nationally. Great. So once the two of those things do tell, we'll be ready to start. Fantastic. Lovely. Thank you for that one. Uh, 24 to 2011, Chief to share the Trust and Confidence Strategy document with the OPCC. That's been received on the 24th. Uh, Laura to check with DCC Cooper if terms of reference uh, are with the, is it the strategic job doc? Yes. Any words there? Is that? It is that one. Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. So that's accurate. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Lovely. Uh, Twenty-four to twenty-twelve. Chief to keep the commissioner in the loop regarding decision three point five relocation of Arnold Police Station. Are there any further developments there? No, that's still being worked through. Um, looking okay. moving to the to the Gedlin, uh, Council building. Still working through that. Okay. Lovely. And uh, 24 to, uh, 2024 to 2013, uh, Michelle to speak to Nicola Wade to review uh, decisions logged in the document, yeah. streamline process and development. Yes, that's nearly there in terms of sign off and we're discussing that with uh, the DEP and Mark as soon as that's been done. Fantastic, okay. So can we just agree that they're accurate and uh, the updates are in? 
Yeah, everyone happy with that? Okay. Um, right, okay, we go over to now to the public agenda. Um, and first on the item list is Chief Superintendent Suk Verma. And Suk is going to do a presentation uh, with, around neighbourhood policing. And he's also going to talk, talk to us verbally around the race action plan, which are um, two areas that are quite important to me. Um, in making sure that we are um, as robust as we can be in those areas. So uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, let Souk uh, present and then we'll uh, go to questions. Uh, then further on in the public um, uh, domain, we will go to professional standards and we'll let uh, Superintendent Catherine Craner present and then we'll go to questions. Okay, and then we'll have an update uh, with regard to the College of Police and Review into Nottinghamshire Police's handling of the Vado Calacane case. Uh, and Michelle will do the verbal update on that. So um, I will now hand over to Chief Superintendent Sigvina. Thanks, Commissioner. Thanks very much. And uh, I'm going to take you through a, um, a journey, hopefully, in regards to neighbourhood policing and where we sit um, in this critical area of business um, as, a, as a force. So early last year now, it's uh, 2023, we commissioned a review in regards to... Um, in regards to neighbourhood policing and our wider approach to demand management. And within that neighbourhood review, Commissioner, what we identified was these various areas that you can see on the screen there. So our neighbourhood teams routinely abstracted. I know it's been a uh, point of concern for a, a period of time, but we realised that actually a lot of our neighbourhood footprints were getting pulled into other areas of business. Those abstractions, as you can see, meant that uh, it routinely left minimal neighbourhood footprints at key times, particularly around the evenings and weekends. And the analytical evidence suggests that the majority of neighbourhood crime is reported within those periods. So, again, we need to, to uh, remedy that particular challenge. There's an inappropriate grading of incidents that's coming in, which is affecting some of our performance management. The shift pattern didn't empower team working. So critically, we you know that the PCSO, the 150 structure that we've got, we're not working in perfect symmetry with the neighbourhood policing team, something of which that alignment was uh, identified as being a, a, a key inhibitor and a blocker. Um, we also had our managed incident teams, the MIT team, that were being managed and supervised by neighbourhood sergeants, which left to a, a process of unclear management and we needed to uh, deal with that and that particular erosion around supervisory activity. Um, this one's quite a, a point of... Um, debate in regards to the neighbourhood policing teams dealing with complex and in-depth investigations prevents them from dealing with their core activity. It's a binary statement, but it's something that we had to take on board in regards to the review, because of course there are some complex neighbourhood challenges that need to be dealt with. So please take this in the, in the spirit that it was written down in terms of the totality of the incidents that were coming through were deemed as overly complex and ought not to be sat in a neighbourhood team when they need to be dealing with what is their core activity. Um, reach a team, so Commissioner, you'll, you'll remember those reach a teams being set up and some of the conversation that's gone on in regards to them. They've made a great impact uh, on targeted activity, which one is one of the three pillars around neighbourhood activity, but it's differing in terms of the engagement uh, and the problem-solving approaches across area. There's inconsistency is what we found, and I'll come on to the remedy as we move forward. Um, and we also realised that through the review, there was a, a, there's a sense of disharmony between our teams and obviously when you look at a lot of the reviews that have gone on nationally around culture and policing and how that then affects our performance we wanted to try and streamline that but they, these are the initial high level outcomes that came from, uh, from the review. So Dan next slide please. So also factored into the presentation I just wanted to identify the concern that's been identified from the uh, HMIC FRS and it is in red at the top of the briefing, which is the force, ne the force needs to make sure that neighbourhood police officers and police community support officers aren't diverted from their main duties to deal with other areas of demand. So in, in summary, that it's a relatively uh, high level but simple ask, I think, because we can deal with that relatively quickly through abstraction policies, through preventing them being pulled away. But we didn't want to deal with that. In fact, I, ironically, our review was commissioned long before the HMIC came into force. And it's something that we took on board in regards to the wider plan. So that's the concern that they've got. In, er in terms of areas to remedy that, Commissioner, as you can see on the, on the screen mm -hmm. there, in our neighbourhood policing review, there's plans already afoot to resolve that particular challenge. So by removing neighbourhood policing teams from the nighttime economy, that saves us nearly 22,000 hours a year mm -hmm. when we can redeploy them into neighbourhood policing in critical areas of business. 
reductions in uh, events abstractions, which will save us again over 15 and a half thousand hours a year. New neighbourhood policing team abstraction and leave policies to make sure that we have a footprint on areas, mm -hmm. to make sure that those teams are visible, accessible, and, and critically doing their core roles. An abstraction recording app uh, and increased scrutiny around Power BI. So what that means is we are actually looking at when those teams and policing is a, a as we know is a, a business which throws the unexpected out. But what we want to know is that when we are abstracting those teams, we're recording it effectively and we are cognizant about when we're making those decisions and they have to go through a chain of command. And finally, the, the bottom one, which is absolutely critical, is around incident allocation reviews. So making sure that we get the right teams into the right places. And we've, we've commissioned this review at the same time that there's other quite large scale pieces of work, such as right care, right person, ASB triage. Uh, local authority service agreements with the city council and the, mm -hmm. and the, the other uh, LA leads as well. So all in all, lots of work going on and lots of interdependencies. So Dan, next one, please. I don't propose to spend a great deal of time on this, uh, Commissioner, but as you know, the, the timeline of neighbourhood policing from the time that we worked together many, many years ago, you know, 2010 was sort of halcyon days of the, the inauguration of the neighbourhood model. Um, and then we've seen a sizable cut uh, over the past few years in regards to finance and some challenges. This was more just a case of for the uh, observers and for the readers to realise that there is a, uh, a significant challenge that has been undertaken in regards to neighbourhood policing and, and prominently the importance of neighbourhood policing in, in, within the wider footprint of police uh, in general. It's often not seen as a specialism. It's often not seen as uh, as um, the pinnacle of policing, and actually it ought to be because it is the bedrock of policing. So, as you can see, that there's a journey of which what we want to take uh, the the um, listeners and the viewers through in regards to how we've uh, come about this particular review and how we want the future of neighbourhood policing to look in Nottinghamshire. So, the three core pillars of neighbourhood policing. It's engagement, it's problem solving, and it's targeted activity. Mm -hmm. Really simple when you break them down, as you can see on the board. Engaging our communities links into the Proud to Serve pledge around earning trust and confidence of the communities. Problem solving leads to better outcome for victims. Targeted activity prevents that in the first place, so it stops the demand coming <coughs> through the door. So there's an inherent symmetry about if we get neighbourhood policing right, we support other critical areas of business, such as response, such as the control room and the performance that we have around 999, 101s. So they're all interdependent. But what we want to do is to get back to basics, if that's the right phrase, yeah. about focusing on the core pillars for neighbourhood policing. So what we're going to do around these areas, as you can see on there, in terms of the neighbourhood pillars and the national framework. So there is a framework that's come through from the, uh, from the centre. We want to identify in terms of engagement what is important to our communities because it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Mm -hmm. We recognise that what is good for areas of the city won't necessarily be good for the areas of the county. So we need to be receptive to that mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that our feedback activity to the communities is pertinent and on point. So we need to make sure that there's that two-way interface between the policing teams and the teams that they are uh, working on behalf of those community members. In regards to our targeted activity, we need to make sure that we are absolutely on point in regards to our repeat offenders, our repeat victims and our hotspot locations. So if you remember earlier on in the presentation, we spoke about Power BI, using the data to provide us with greater understanding about where we need to be and why. Mm -hmm. Part of that is actually factored into the shift pattern that I'll come on to at a later point so that we can deal with the crim uh, criminality and we can deal with the preventative activity as opposed to letting it stack up. And finally, solving problems. This is a big thing that we've uh, discussed uh, within force, and obviously the HMRC are rightly questioning around our approaches to problem solving, dealing with the root causes of problems within our neighbourhoods and reducing repeat demand. And we know the impact and we've seen them through various incidents that have occurred nationally. If we can uh, root that out at the first point of call, and if we can support those individuals, then we're going to lead to improved community confidence and improved victim satisfaction rates as well. So the neighbourhood policing model, as you can see on the screen, is a simplified model. 
we have sought to embed the reach of teams within the numbers that we've got in there. Each area will have a district commander, the, the NPI. Within that area, there are three sergeants, and then they've got a, a varied amount of PCSOs and PCs, depending on the threat, risk and harm, and the data analysis that we've done in regards to what areas we feel need what. The number of PCSOs still remains at, at record numbers, as you can see, and uh, the number of PCs has not been reduced at all. So we are putting in almost 260 police constables into our neighbourhood policing model, which is as high as it has been. Mm -hmm. um, in conjunction with that, we've created a shift pattern review to ensure that our neighbourhood policing teams remain visible, accessible and on duty together. There's, there's collaboration between the PCSOs and the police constables. There is a single line management structure and we've also, in addition to that, we've created four priority tasking teams, two on the city, two on the county, and they will be dealing with volume crime, stroke sack offenders, serious and inquisitive crime, those that cause most harm and most risk to those communities. So those teams are already starting to see benefit through some of the um, activity that they've taken part in, and, and, I, and I can share that with you at a later point for your, uh, for your information. So important for us is to deliver the pledge on behalf of the force and the chief constable uh, to deliver an outstanding service we can all be proud of. So what we need to understand is that we've got a collaborative view around what is outstanding. How do we want to achieve that is through a neighbourhood vision document, making sure that we're clear about achieving that vision. That vision ties into the proud to serve pledge, mm -hmm. making sure that we've got specific career conversation objectives for neighbourhood policing officers, which we haven't had before making sure that those officers feel proud to do that role, understand the importance that they have in regards to that bedrock of British policing, that role that they undertake in terms of keeping communities safe. And we need to also measure ourselves against national neighbourhood performance indicators. Mm. We, are, we are, through hard work, reducing the amount of neighbourhood crime that takes, part, uh, takes place in Nottinghamshire. We will continue to drive that down even more with this new model that we've got. And we need to commit to the neighbourhood pill pillars, the three pillars that I just mentioned to you earlier on. We need to make sure that we've got tailored structures of our management um, to develop that process as we go forward. We have already embedded uh, ASB, so antisocial behaviour officers and problem solving officers into our neighbourhood hub. They will facilitate and provide support mechanisms to the neighbourhood team so they're not left our own. So we've already started to put the infrastructure behind the plan um, and also, finally, I want bespoke engagement plans coming from the Prevention Hub to enable us to, to deliver outstanding service. So without reciting what I said earlier, what is good for St Anne's or what is good for Radford is not necessarily going to be the same for Mansfield. We need to make sure that we are more scientific and we are more tailored in our approach. And that's what we will be as well. Next slide. So I just wanted to touch upon Opreacher, and we've spoken already with our local authority leads and MPs in regards to the removal of Reacher. What I'm really clear to say, Commissioner, is that the removal of Reacher is the removal of a brand. Mm -hmm. It's a brand that has been perhaps uh, divisive internally, but has delivered <coughs> some very good results. That won't change. Mm -hmm. They've always been a part of the neighbourhood establishment. Um, when we originally um, commenced the Opreacher uh, pilot which was at Besswood which was not dissimilar from Operation Kingdom if you remember from many years ago with Vanguard Plus it was of that nature where we put in, in uh, excess in excess resources into an area to deal with a specific problem through a 4p plan as you can see through this what we've done in terms of the neighborhood model is we've absorbed those reacher teams into the neighborhood model so that the numbers remain consistent but they come under the branding, the universal branding of neighbourhood policing. Mm -hmm. They will deal with those three targeted areas of, uh, sorry, those three pillar areas of targeted activity, engaging our communities and problem solving. That will not change. But what we want to make sure is that we pull away from any sort of branding where it's going to be divisive, where it's going to perhaps cause disharmony, because mm -hmm. what we want to focus all our efforts and attention on is delivering an outstanding service we can all be proud of for our communities. Mm -hmm. So there is no loss of uh, any resources, it's a simplified model and it's making sure that our communities recognise those individuals that support them on their patch to keep them safe. And 
I just wanted to finally touch upon some areas around um, the fact that as a business and as a service and as senior leaders, we have listened. We've listened to challenges such as uh, nighttime economy, so putting officers into the NTE, pulling them away from their areas and plugging them into city centre policing when actually we can deal with that in themselves. Um, we've also found that we are abstracting far too often. The HMIC have confirmed that through their report, so we're seeking to remedy that. Um, so as I said, in, in finalisation, we have listened. We're looking at a new NTE resourcing model, as I've discussed, a longer term approach to dealing with events through better forward planning, making sure that we get the right people on duty at the right time, and it's a balanced three team pattern, new leave and abstractions policy, scrutiny from uh, senior officers that needs to be there in regards to it. And one final thing that I wanted to add that's not in the presentation, the National College of Policing identify that neighbourhood policing is a specialism, mm. and as such, it needs to have a specific number of training days per year. We have already mapped them into our new proposed shift pattern so that we can start to make sure that we can improve the offering that we give to the public, mm. and we make sure that we recognise the role for the, the level of importance that it portrays. And I believe that that ought to take us towards the marginal gains. So these are just some areas, Commissioner, mm -hmm. uh, for the viewers to be aware of. And the way that we've articulated that is just to start to understand that if we can deal with some of these areas and they get us a few percent extra in terms of our, our performance, they're all going to start to come together and, and deliver something far bigger. So as you can see on the screen, the immediate justice pilot that we're doing around antisocial behaviour, dealing with first-time entrants into the system, deviating them away from the courts and actually getting reparatory duty, the shift pattern review, making sure that we're more efficient and effective, priority tasking teams, dealing with high volume outstanding offenders mm. uh, for, for SAC offences that are causing significant harm on, on area. The MIT, which is the managed incident team, RIDA, which is remote investigations, domestic abuse, and the CRIM, which is contact uh, resolution incident management, in essence, in summary for the viewer, they are tend to be uh, lower level crime that can be dealt with remotely. We've now consolidated them into the contact management department mm. across the uh, across the courtyard here at headquarters. So they're all working underneath a single team with a single uh, supervisory patch. Um, I also have mentioned throughout there things that we've done in regards to our abstraction policy and monitoring. We want to improve the incident grading and allocation review to make sure we're more effective in terms of how we deal with crime mm -hmm. using the most appropriate agency policy. Right care, right person, or right care, right service, it says there, but it should be right care, right person. Antisocial behaviour, triage, and then the three areas on the right hand side I've already touched upon, mm -hmm. which is the prevention of most appropriate and removal of, of uh, unrequired services at events where we want them to become more efficient and effective. Okay. So, in summary, that there, there are there are some pillars that we wanted to make sure that we get out in regards to the uh, HMIC work under Op Catalyst, and as you can see there, the debriefing pillars that we talk to our teams about are fairly simplistic in regards to the three pillars: target activity, engaging our communities, and problem solving, ensuring that we have plans for problems and we have a consistency of approach mm -hmm. in how we record those plans and how we target them. Our demand management and resource approach that I spoke to you already about, our approach to abstractions, and making sure critically, and this is a really important one for us, our continuous learning cycle. Mm -hmm. Making sure that we learn, we improve, and we continue to make sure that our neighbourhood officers focus on their main duties and their local area of concern. Thank you, yes. I do have questions. Can I just thank you for that? That was very thorough and I really um, am pleased um, with the simplicity in which you're delivering neighbourhood policing or looking to deliver neighbourhood policing um, and the numbers as well that you're committing to it yes. which um, shows that um, you are committed to that. Can I just add just a couple of things? Yeah, Sorry, yes, apologies, absolutely. Commissioner. Just to say that um, there's been a lot of work that's gone on and just to reassure you that what we haven't done is we've done this in isolation. We've sought advice from the college around mm. some of the models that we're adopting. Mm. We've had a peer review around our problem solving plans. So we're actually looking and reaching out to other areas, other forces, other specialists to get that good practice to make sure that what we are doing mm. is in line with what's going well nationally as well. So we've made sure it's a really informed approach rather than just being sort of 
looking inwards with try to um, mm. you know explore all those opportunities to be as good as we possibly can yeah so just wanted to add that no no I, i'll take that on board absolutely so i have got some questions i mean some of it you've really touched on um but uh, just to sort of like just go into a little bit more uh, depth i suppose can you just sort of answer to me uh, so i suppose in or, or sort of give me some idea what extent are the supervisory structures and resources under the new model sufficient and appropriate for the level of staffing and workload on demand um, so, well, in, in answer to the question, Commissioner, we, we've, through the review, through process evolution, and also the work that we're doing with the College of Policing and other mm -hmm. stakeholders, we believe that the numbers within that system uh, are, are appropriate. So the one district, one district commander, the three sergeants, mm -hmm. to manage the resources that are below. We feel that that is an appropriate number um, universally across the command. Uh, because we've taken away the managed incident team from them mm -hmm. and we've taken away some other subsidiary resources so that actually they can focus solely on neighbourhood mm -hmm. policing. We feel that is an appropriate um, resource to uh, oversee those those numbers. But what we are committed to doing, um, Commissioner, is a post-implementation review. Okay. So in, within the, the first 12 months, once we've embedded this particular model, we will be going back together with uh, key stakeholders, partners, the College of Policing to review our model and what we won't be naive to do is to not consider any flexibility or fluidity that we need to, to, to make in no such decisions but what I wanted to commit to at the earliest possibility is to make sure that we we commit the same number of supervisors mm -hmm. in there but giving them more scope to deal with what they need to deal with mm -hmm. so that we're not deviating away deviating them away from from uh, other demand okay and, and adding sorry adding mm -hmm. to that and as you've heard me speak before we're doing a lot of focus on around those first line supervisors in terms of the skills they've got to do the role mm -hmm. so we've got additional training now for those supervisors mm -hmm. so whilst the numbers we think are right what we want to do is make sure that those people are really confident to deal with the incidents and the types of things we're asking them to do so yeah. we've got a lot of investment in those individuals and okay. as Sukesh has just identified we've got that sort of much closer eye on them now mm -hmm. um, and we will do that post implementation review and we are you know if we need to change things we will mm -hmm. we've already changed numbers within response we've increased numbers there because we recognize there weren't enough at the moment we're happy with the numbers but we just need to see you know what happens now with that yeah. sort of more clear focus on what they need to do okay. better um, increased skills to deal with it and the support and then we can see where we go from after that Okay, no, thank you for that. Um, have officers, staff and unions been fully consulted on the proposed changes in shift patterns and what sort of feedback have you received? Uh, good good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the consultation process is closed. Mm -hmm. We are replying to the question and answer sessions um, at the moment. Um, the Federation and the unions have been consulted mm -hmm. and have been involved throughout. They're very uh, supportive of the process because mm -hmm. actually it's going to be hopefully an improvement for the support of their particular members. Um, local authority leads have also been briefed on the, on the changes and they're supportive of it because it's going to give greater footprint and, and mm -hmm. visibility in their area. I know I'm veering away from the question, but I'll come back onto it. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, uh, very finally, um, what we haven't done is we haven't finalised the shift pattern um, just at this moment in time because we're going to look at some of the variations that have come out from the question and answer sessions. Okay. So what I want to be very clear about is it's not a definitive fate complete, what we will look at to mm -hmm. do is to work in the framework that we've set of what we want to achieve around a balanced three team pattern, yeah. but working together with the unions, the feds and our officers and staff mm. to see where improvements can perhaps be made. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, also, what impact has seizing abstractions in nighttime economy? So you, we've already touched on this really, mm. that you'll be pulling from um, other resources. And I suppose, what is the impact on that? And albeit that some of that resource is very sporadic in, in the time of football season and, yes. and other seasons. So how are you going to kind of manage that? So what I want to do is, um, is to look at what we've got across the greater landscape and, and mm. not just go for the easy option. Mm. So obviously we've got lots of other uniform resources that we can pull from. Mm -hmm. We need to be um, far slicker and better in terms of our uh, long-term planning cycles around yeah. major events. Of course, there still will be events where neighbourhood officers will perhaps have to drop into it, mm. where um, they are serious or significant, and that's where the abstraction recording app will help us identify where those mm. those challenges may come. But in terms of the nighttime economy, what I think is really important to, to mention is the world has moved on in terms of the way that nighttime economy is 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 policed. Lots of areas around Nottingham and Nottinghamshire mm -hmm. have a nighttime economy. 
that was the the key focus from our local authority um, leads, such as you know West Bridgeford, Arnold, mm -hmm. um, Mansfield, uh, going out to Newark. They've all got an NTE which isn't currently policed in the same way as the city right. is. So what we what we rec recognise is actually our neighbourhood policing teams. Part of their core duty is early intervention, engagement, targeted activity, the early stages of it, which isn't actually the enforcement elements of a nighttime economy. It's setting the tempo and the tone in their respective areas and districts mm. early on. In regards to uh, resourcing the latter part of a nighttime economy, which is the, uh, I guess, the question, mm. Commissioner, um, we will still have our tactical support teams uh, out on, on the area and we will be uh, supplementing those resources together with uh, response officers. Mm -hmm. So we've uplifted our response establishment mm -hmm. uh, through the process of evolution review and we feel through that uplift in our establishment we'll be able to fulfil the remaining slots from nighttime economy for, for our critical city areas through that uh, structure. Okay. Can I just follow that? Mm, of course you can, commission. absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so I think it's a, a question of um, sequencing, so, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The reassurance around the sequencing, because I think the presentation gave the impression that the neighbourhood teams will be doing purely neighbourhood yeah. work and that the pre-planned events and the nighttime economy would be done in a different way. Yeah. But it's that, is, there a, is there a gap before that? that additional resourcing model kicks in, I suppose, but some reassurance around the sequencing, I suppose. Well, the, the, yeah, the, the, it's lots of moving parts. The, there is a lot of moving parts. The, sequence is, uh, the sequencing is all in order at the moment, so we, we will be presenting a plan to the, um, the chief and the chief officer teams in regards to when we close down our neighbourhood teams mm. from doing the enforcement elements of nighttime economy. As I mentioned earlier on, every district has an element of an NTE, which we don't currently police uh, um, independently. But what I do want is I want that preventative activity out on the area, but also engaging with our communities. We often forget that nighttime economy is a wonderful chance mm. to engage with communities. Mm -hmm. it's, it's probably the greatest time that we have large footfalls in all of our areas moving around in the early stages, and it, certainly. But there isn't going to be a a period where I think that we're going to be at any risk, by the way. We're going to sequence it to the point that we know the date that we feel that we can lift the model for response to take it on, mm -hmm. at which point then we will seek to then drop our neighbourhood team back in to do their, their core activities in terms of those three pillars that you saw on the screen. Okay, no worries. Um, the the uh, next question is, um, I went out recently and um, there's an individual who had mental health um, and he took the resource of three officers uh, two ambulance staff and um, a, a social worker and the, obviously the question I want to ask is about right care right person and how are you going to manage that um, and how is it being implemented on a local basis because uh, what struck me was that the three officers they took an hour to talk the individual out to get the care that uh, he needed and then they had to follow as well yeah. uh, so really I would say probably three hours of their shift was following um, as, as well as assisting so it's sort of um, how we're going to sort of manage this uh, drain on what I would consider to be resource yes it's needed at that time but are they the right people to deal with that situation and that's of course what right care right mm. person is seeking to, mm. to, to bring in which is uh, in effect making sure that we are not going to get inadvertently um, pulled into to dealing with things which are perhaps mm. not deemed as policing issues we, we are um, significantly down the track in regards to the implementation of right care, right, pass, mm -hmm. right person. What I think it is cognizant to, to mention within this forum is that actually we were perhaps um, quite far ahead of the, the game in regards to our approach towards supporting uh, mental health and, and people in crisis because within our contact management teams, within the vulnerability of, we already have a uh, collaboration between... Mm -hmm. um, uh, nurses and, and police officers through the uh, mental health street triage team. Mm. So I'd be interested to know, Commissioner, why they were why they weren't deployed to that with the nurse, mm. or, or perhaps they were to understand whether there was a blockage that could have been mm -hmm. unpicked for those officers. Mm. Um, we have a specific lead identified for right care right person, yeah. which is handed over now to Chief Inspector Craig Berry uh, from James Walker. But from from that point of view. Um, I'm happy to get a full briefing for you around how the how the model is going to work and mm -hmm. what we seek to achieve by implementing it. Okay, that'll be a yeah, idea. absolutely. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Um, what early impact have the new priority tasking teams had? Uh, I think you kind of touched on it. Um, and have you got any success stories? 
uh, there are some, mm. there are already some very, very successful stories. I'm, I'm slightly nervous about how much I can say on mm. the on the video because of uh, some areas are still going through, um, uh, or some of the individuals are still going through the process. But needless to say that our force priority was arrested by the um, the priority tasking team. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of a clue is in the title really of what we set the team up to do. But mm -hmm. they they identified someone who was wanted for multiple serious indictable offences mm -hmm. uh, and, and subsequently uh, arrested him and that individual is now uh, on remand. Mm -hmm. um, they've also had uh, a number of other uh, incidents or, or jobs where they've, they've dealt with um, quite sizable uh, issues on local communities and OCG where they've been responsible for 14 mm -hmm. or 15 um, separate incidents of crime uh, are currently going through with our, um, our priority tasking teams as well. So they it'll be fair to say that they are very well used at the moment. They are certainly um, uh, fulfilling exactly mm -hmm. what I wanted them to, to do. Their terms of reference is very clear in regards to what we would seek from them mm -hmm. as well. And, and I think there are a number of success stories that I'm happy to to provide to you and the team uh, mm -hmm. if you give me the time to prepare that. Absolutely, yeah. that'd, yeah. Be, that'd be well welcomed. Um, uh, so what's the force vision for volunteers? I know we've just done a volunteers event and it's been volunteers week. Um, and what are the sort of plans to to grow for the specials working for Knott's Police? Um, well, hopefully you remember, Commissioner, that mm -hmm. the, the specials sat under me um, a number of years ago and still do, I suppose, vicariously through my role. Um, the specials is an area of business where I've just been speaking to the Chief Constable around the various uh, routes of entry that we have. Mm -hmm. So we have specials that come through the university route as well as our traditional um, specials that will come through the conventional mm -hmm. route. Um, we are just shy of uh, of 90 at the moment, and my aspirational hope is to, to get that over 100. I certainly see that there is a, a greater role for specials to play when we start to consider things such as nighttime economy, when we start to consider things such as football. So, for instance, recently uh, I authorised for 18 specials to be trained in public order so that they can support our football mm -hmm. uh, policing events. Uh, they've also uh, recently been attending our football matches to do um, engagement, mm -hmm. which is a probably a good methodology of trying to reduce any violence at football matches or any disorder, because by early intervention, we've, uh, on the evidence shows that it starts to reduce any threat, risk and harm. Mm -hmm. So um, volunteers are quite simply critical to our, our business. Specials are just obviously one arm of them. Mm -hmm. But we've got the various people that came to your event the other day, um, and I, I certainly see them as something that we we need to put more emphasis in regards to our, our volunteers mm -hmm. and, and working collaboratively together. Mm -hmm. So within that, I see that the, the majority of Rattlehead churches through the custody mm -hmm. pastoral work, mm -hmm. the uh, independent community scrutiny panel, uh, members that are working so hard with us around stop and search that we'll come on to in, in the race action plan. But in regards to the plans to grow them, um, absolutely, mm -hmm. it is a critical area that we need to look at, and and uh, and the the, uh, the NTU is the part that I think we can grow probably faster than anywhere else okay. uh, through the university forum. Mm -hmm. What we do with our specials is we, mm -hmm. we have um, entry permanently open for them, so it's not like mm -hmm. regulars that you would uh, open and close entry. We've actually got sixty two people at the minute sort of mm -hmm. going through that process, mm -hmm. um, but I think as as, as Sukesh has outlined, it's around what role we actually have them doing. So mm -hmm. we're actually trying to look to make sure that. So some of them will come in with an, a, a, um, a plan and the hope to, to reach, you know, to join the police mm -hmm. in the long term. And we will, you know, want to certainly to give, give them certain skills to enable them to do that. There's others who want to join for different reasons and we're trying to actually widen mm -hmm. the scope of how we use special. So the work around the football just gives them another opportunity to do something, to get, yeah. you know, to get involved with different elements of policing. So I think if the more we can offer, I think the more we can attract yeah. people mm -hmm. and probably more importantly is retain some of those numbers as well. Mm -hmm. There'll always be the attrition as people move on to the police. That's a good thing, that's what we want. Yeah. We want to make sure we are retaining those that want to just, you know, are interested in the role mm -hmm. in its in its purest form. Really. No, I think it's a great tool to have for specials and yeah. um, how that can uh, uh, open the door for the police and give them the experience that they need um, to really understand the job. So yeah, I'm very supportive of that. Um, your presentation obviously uh, sort of suggests Operation Reacher coming to an end and being removed. Um, and you talk about it as being the brand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, does this mean that the branding is fully discontinued um, and that's, that's, that, that's finished with? And are we sort of aware of the impact of Reacher um, and how that's been positively received in our communities and how are we 
telling our communities that this has come to an end, but it's now changed. Yeah, so um, the the branding the branding has come to an end, mm. although it will still be visible on on certain police vehicles mm. and, and and areas that just need to need to be allowed to wash through for one of a mm. better phrase. Um, the communication has already started through our neighbourhood policing inspectors and through our comms teams in regards to the branding of mm. a neighbourhood policing team, as opposed to it, and we we formally attended an accountability board around um, three months ago to mm. discuss the the process of how we were going to start to manoeuvre towards what is going to be the simplistic approach around mm. neighbourhood policing, mm. everyone under one umbrella. Um, from a local authority uh, chief executive point of view, it was received positively mm -hmm. because, as I said, that there's been um, there's been areas that perhaps have been more proficient and efficient than others, um, and there's areas where they've had better benefits th than others. What we want to do is to derive that consistency across the entire force with all of our neighbourhood teams. So on the whole, it's been met with positively. And probably the greatest challenge that we were gonna face was not from the communities, because they quite frankly wanna see officers attending and, and, and they're not gonna to be too concerned about where mm. they are from. The greatest concern was internally from those that were on those teams. Mm. But now that they recognise that actually their role and their remit within neighbourhoods is gonna just be widened out to everyone that's on there to mm. be able to drive towards those three priority areas, there hasn't actually been a huge amount of negativity. In fact, there's been a lot of positivity and a lot of positivity, as I mentioned earlier, around the unions and the federation seeing that actually we're going to create larger teams working together collaboratively mm -hmm. as opposed to pockets of smaller teams across the force. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, what impact has the Home Office funded hotspots policing patrols having on ASB and social behaviour and serious violence? Um, well, I don't have the stats in front of me to, to go through uh, w with you, Commissioner, at the moment. Um, what I can say is that we are staffing up um, resources and units to go out on patrol mm. in, in critical areas. As I mentioned in the presentation, Power BI is being used to identify where that threat, risk and harm is occurring. Um, we've also got that in conjunction with our immediate justice uh, and social behaviour programme. Um, and, and I think feel through the out of court disposal board when you look at the number of referrals so 138 so far that have gone through we are starting to turn the screw mm. around uh, around antisocial behavior i would think we'll see the real benefit of it as we move towards the summer when the weather improves and you've got the football championships and various other things mm. um but at the moment um we are staffing our vehicles and, and i am confident with the approach from our neighborhood police and lead mm -hmm. as to uh, as to how we're going to tackle the challenge lovely Okay, is there anything further you would like to ask? No, so. no? okay. So on neighbourhood policing, uh, I can close that off. Is there anything you, you would like to add? No, I was just going to add on the last bit around these, the antisocial behaviour, some of the additional mm. funding that we've secured has actually helped to support some of the work the City Council were doing previously. Mm. And it's well known in terms of the position they find themselves financially, so we're able mm. to do additional targeted activity in, in the cities and uh, you know, and, and assist with CCTV and some of that sort of preventative work as mm. well. So uh, okay. there's a real coordinated effort around sort of that antisocial behaviour and trying to improve that and I think that will only see the benefits from the neighbour policing model. Mm. So when Sukesh talked about the you know some of the early activity around that time economy, that's the sort of thing that we're talking about. You're gonna have those neighbourhood teams that can be in those areas mm -hmm. where previously they'd have been pulled out to go and do something else. They can start to tackle some of those issues early mm. on mm. so that before they actually escalate and become you know a real issue for the residents and people that mm. live uh, in the areas. No, just to say that I, I welcome the changes and I, 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 I'm looking forward to see how the structure evolves and develops and hopefully uh, get the feedback from uh, the public on uh, hopefully that it's working a lot better. Mm. So that's good. Thank you. Okay, um, over to uh, Sakesh again for the Police Race Action Plan. Right, hopefully you've got the, uh, the, the, the plan highlights um, in, in front of you. So... Um, I'm not a particular fan of looking at myself, Dan, so we'll move to the next one there. So if we if we can come through. So um, I'm, I'm conscious around the way that we're going to present this is in a, in a slightly different format, but I want to talk you through the um, the way that we've tackled the race action plan. So a national plan, a, a long-standing um, area of business that hasn't probably been tackled in British policing as well as it ought to have been, and certainly um, from my point of view, very welcome um, because it's, it's actually got some sort of significant meaning to myself as well as uh, as well as lived experience as well. Um, so we have now got a structure whereby it's embedded through a strategic meeting. Myself as the strategic lead, and there are four work streams that you can see on the board in front of you. 
um, on the right hand side of that page. Each of those work streams um, are, uh, have assigned a lead and under that lead they, they chair their own respective meetings. So there is, a, there is a strong sense of a governance process around it, Commissioner. <laughs> whereby they will then feed into my strategic uh, group. Um, and also, as you'll be aware, that we do have a, um, probably one of the first in the country, a strategic race action plan coordinator in Jerome Edwards, mm -hmm. who isn't uh, from the police um, and is a member of the community, first and foremost, who joined us and added a complete different dimension mm -hmm. to, towards what we're doing. So I'm um, very proud of where we are at the moment. You can see the seven commitments that we've outlined mm -hmm. on the left-hand side of there, your screen. Um, number one, uh, the reason why number one uh, is number one um, is because it's the most important for me around zero tolerance of racism with the Nottinghamshire Police. Mm. First and foremost, uh, we serve without fear or favour and we don't want anyone within the business not feeling that uh, they are supporting them. Again, you've got Catherine here from PSD, but this is far wider than PSD. This is just us as an organisation, as a business and as a family, making sure that we, we deal with uh, that particular challenge, both internally and externally, as strong as we possibly can. And, and that's the commitment I can give to you as the strategic lead for this programme. Um, commitment number two, adopt a ref uh, an explain or reform approach. That's part, part of that is, um, is around being absolutely transparent, about making sure that we are committed to change and making sure that we're not wedded to the past. There are some good elements of the past, but there's also some elements that we would rather forget and through the programme we need to recognise that there's significant opportunities for us to, to move forward as a business. Number three is to understand the impact and history of police and ethnic minority communities. Um, you'll be aware of the extensive work that we have got in force around uh, expanding not only the first and second line of management training that the, uh, the Chief just mentioned but also around black history. You know we've now got a bespoke programme where um, I believe over a thousand people have now gone through that programme, which is insightful uh, and it actually provides some real context about the challenges around racism and, uh, and police and ethnic minority communities. And let's not forget our city community is over 40% ethnic minority in terms of the census. And as a, as a force wide area, we are close to 15%. So we've got a significant um, community that we police and unless we understand the impact of policing those communities how can we police them effectively and how can we ever have the legitimacy and trust of them in the truest sense so it's a very important commitment number four improve support for ethnic minority victims of crime so that will be more pertinent as we'll go through to uh, discuss around work stream four as we go there but uh, what we've historically learned through the national race action plan is that um, victims of crime from ethnic minority backgrounds perhaps haven't had the same level of uh, support and service from the police force mm -hmm. and you only have to go back in in terms of some of the significant events that happened in the early 90s and even the early 2000s to recognize that actually perhaps there would have been a different um, level of support and outcome had, it, had they been from a different background we can't allow that to occur mm -hmm. that is why that's in our commitment manifesto as you can see on the screen there number five increase the involvement of ethnic minority people in communities um, that is within our policing structure that's mm -hmm. within our policing family so you asked me commissioner around mm -hmm. volunteers mm -hmm. and you saw uh, last week just how many diverse communities we have attending that volunteers program who mm -hmm. are now trusted friends of ours mm -hmm. who are now um, confidants of ours who will support us through critical and, and major incidents um, but also will be a sounding board. Mm. And that's really important for us to be able to have that because historically we haven't had that. Mm -hmm. That also links heavily into um, pillar or work stream three that I'll come through in, in, uh, in due course. Um, number six, improve support for ethnic minority officers and staff. Mm -hmm. um, lived experience from someone sat here talking to you and mm -hmm. no doubt from yourself, Commissioner, around the challenge that that um, ethnic minority officers and staff face, and, and this isn't uh, this is uh, this isn't about us sort of going on a um, on a journey without actually taking the whole force with us to recognise the importance about working together, um, respecting each other, and understanding that that true difference actually can improve the workforce beyond belief, uh, and and actually really taking that on as, mm. as as an understanding. And then number seven is developing a representative workforce. 
uh, and a culture of belonging. Mm -hmm. I mentioned this when I was the superintendent lead, which seemed like a lifetime ago when I led up in 2019, which was around, um, we can work really hard to bring in diverse communities into the business, but unless we are mature enough as a business and we understand that we need to be incumbent, that we don't mix hot and cold water, we're gonna lose them as soon as we, as we recruit them. And it was something that I stay staunch to to this moment because we have to make sure that when we bring people into this organisation, from whatever background, from whatever belief, we have to make sure that they feel that it's a place that they can belong, flourish, mm -hmm. because if they do, they're going to deliver an outstanding service that we can all be proud of and be a part of the policing family. So very clear, Commissioner, very mm -hmm. thought out commitments, I hope you will agree, on the left hand side, which are um, achievable. Mm -hmm. I think they are um, easily recognisable from all four corners of the workforce. Um, and, uh, and and absolutely makes sense in regards to the wider plan. Mm -hmm. So on the, the right-hand side, when the um, inaugural plan was created, they described them as four pillars, mm -hmm. uh, which we've described now as four work streams. Um, we wanted to simplify this so that people can understand, so not only internal members of the organisation, but external can understand what they stand for. So as you can see, work stream one is represented. The lead for that is Claire Salter, mm -hmm. uh, who is our head of people services. And we want communities to see themselves uh, when they look at policing. This means focusing on our representation, re retention and changing our internal culture. Mm -hmm. It's quite a sizable beast really, isn't it, on mm -hmm. the work stream. And, and to think that we're going to achieve that in, in a short period of time is probably very aspirational. Mm -hmm. But within that work stream, uh, there are some key stakeholders that come around the table to work with Claire around um, those areas of recruitment, representation and retention and looking at challenges around internal culture. We've also brought in external partners mm -hmm. into that work stream to support us in regards to how we can improve, how can we better ourselves. Only recently we had um, the resident psychologist at uh, Nottingham Forest and Nottinghamshire County Cricket Club mm -hmm. uh, who works with top level sports people who are paid inordinate amounts of money and worth mm. millions and millions of pounds to come in to start to, to help us to understand around cultural competence, around the difference in terms of the, the generational gap, mm -hmm. the difference in terms of how we can make people feel that this is a place that they can be their true authentic self. Mm -hmm. A phrase that's often used, Commissioner, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. probably not always meant. Um, so represented is a tough, tough area of business. Um, but it's an area of business that we've given uh, that work stream a real leg up because we are now at uh, near record numbers of, okay. of diverse mm. uh, officers and staff. A lot of that work was done under the, the uplift regime and we now have got a real job to continue to springboard further on mm -hmm. to make sure that the police force uh, represents and, and, and looks like the communities that we, we serve. Mm. That's not the whole sole challenge, by the way, as well. We need to make sure that Whilst um, a rainbow police force is, is not what's going to solve a sort of critical crisis around that, we need to make sure that the wider workforce mm. understands the challenges, which is why there's a symmetry between that work stream and the commitments that we talk about around understanding the past. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move on to work stream two, which is not over policed. Mm -hmm. Um, this is about treating our communities fairly with respect and dignity, eliminating racial bias and disproportionality in our service delivery. So my workstream lead for pillar or for workstream two is uh, Chief Inspector Stephen O'Neill, mm -hmm. who's based down in the prevention hub. Um, within this pillar, there are some real um, success stories thus far. Mm -hmm. um, I chaired the powers board this morning, so our use of stop and search, for instance, is very prominent within this workstream. Mm -hmm. And our uh, use of stop and search is um, very proportionate in comparison with the national average. Mm -hmm. So um, per uh, thousand people nationally, uh, it's nine people that are stop and search. Mm -hmm. In Nottinghamshire, it's five. Mm -hmm. But our arrest rate and our positive outcome rate is amongst the highest in the country, mm -hmm. at 40%, which shows that we are proportionate with the power, but we are actually using it intelligently and wisely, which is resulting to positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that's a good news story in, in, in summary in a very quick whistle stop tour. Also included within Not Over Policed is, is working very closely around understanding the data around the Section 163 mm -hmm. vehicle stops, mm -hmm. understanding our use of force. So mm -hmm. that was again discussed this morning. How proportionate or, or otherwise are we? Our proportionality or disproportionality in regards to use of force and stop and search and arrest on black communities 
is dropping month by month, which is a good news story to show that actually all the learning that's taking place from a business and the greater scrutiny and, and, and oversight that we're having is starting to make a difference. And I think that there is, it would be unfair not to mention that actually we are starting to work better and closer mm. with a lot of key partners as a result of our work. Um, earlier today, I've had some positive commentary from various mm. community groups uh, who are people of colour, who are praising the way that we are actively as a police force trying to, ch to target these areas. Mm -hmm. So it's about understanding the data, it's about focusing our minds towards areas of, of challenge, mm. And they are areas of challenge that have been significant over um, the last 40 years in policing, mm -hmm. which have caused irreparable damage in some communities. But I'm confident as the lead for the Race Action Plan in Nottinghamshire that we can be one of the forces that turns the tide better mm -hmm. than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Involved. Uh, Workstream 3. We want our communities uh, to involve our communities in policing. We will only fully understand their needs by uh, listening. This combined with an intention to respond leads to improved engagement. Mm -hmm. We discussed um, about the reformed independent advisory group. That is just one part of it. Mm -hmm. you know, so the, the new strategic independent advisory group with the learning that we took from Hendricks in regards to the widening out of the subgroups to make sure that we capture more of the communities that mm -hmm. we serve is just one prime example of involved. Chief Inspector Carl Thomas is leading this for me, but it is fair to say that whenever we have declared any major or critical incidents, our psyche as a business now is one of the first things that we do is invoke the support from our mm -hmm. key community contacts, our independent advisory groups, our scrutineers. Mm -hmm. um, that brings me on to the scrutineers mm -hmm. around involved. So mm -hmm. through your, your office, Commissioner, we have mm -hmm. the independent community scrutiny yeah. panel. And it was the first time since that process began that all five independent stop and searches were graded as green. I think that's a watershed moment, I genuinely do. Mm -hmm. Other people might look at me like I'm crazy, but to say that they have independently selected five stop and searches without us having any influence about what they chose, observed them as a, as a tough panel, and rightly so, and said to us at the end of it, we find no fault in those five, mm -hmm. shows to me that the process is starting to work. But we've also got that feedback loop as well, so when they do tell us that things need to improve, mm -hmm. we will we'll feed that back in through our through our learning and development and our process teams uh, right the way through to our analysts. Mm -hmm. So involved is critically important and that is going across the piece in regards to how we do it. That also includes a majority of black-led churches. Mm -hmm. That includes also other community partners. So making sure that our communities have a voice, they have a say and they understand and they see critically that Nottinghamshire Police mm -hmm. want to improve. Because we can say everything that we possibly want but unless they actually see tangible action, they're not going to come along on that journey with us. Mm -hmm. So Workstream 3, I'm really proud of the work that Carl Thomas has done on that. Mm -hmm. um, this It's a very early journey at the moment. Mm -hmm. There's still more that I want us to achieve and, and seek to achieve in regards to that. But that is that is where we are in regards to that. And finally, not underprotected. So we want to protect our members of the community, making them all feel safe, taking action to keep the most vulnerable. That's led by... Uh, uh, Chief Superintendent Leona Skir, mm -hmm. that is very much around the crime, that's around the victims, making sure that we understand the data, mm -hmm. making sure that when we have, um, well, that there are no pockets within our crime types that are adversely affected or, or our communities are adversely affected because of, mm. of what they're born as. So making sure that we're really drilling into the data, mm -hmm. understanding the impact around hate, the impact against violence against the person, the impact against things such as VORG, you know, all those those key areas that mm -hmm. you'll be assessing us on, making sure that throughout that we're not underprotecting our communities, we give them a fair and proper service uh, as we would to anyone else. Mm -hmm. So that's our four work streams that uh, I just wanted to take through. And I could talk to you for hours about it, but I mm -hmm. don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, and the, because you'll probably tell me off. And on the next slide, you'll see our plan on the page. So within that, I'll leave this one with you, but you can see that there are four work stream areas. And within that, there are key areas that we've identified identified across there, mm -hmm. which link directly into the commitments at the top of the page. This has been carefully thought through. When we look at our progress in comparison with other forces, when I go to strategic meetings at the College of Policing, mm. together with other strategic leads, I feel that we are in a very good place. Mm. I feel that we've already started to make good progress in regards to four work streams and we've got a clear plan of what we want to achieve as to what does good look like. Mm -hmm. You know, what does success of the race action plan look like? 
um, is, is highlighted within uh, within the, the scope identified within this document. Mm -hmm. And then the final uh, slide is just a structured chart, which is within the plan on the page, and yeah. as you can see, those individuals. Mm -hmm. So I'm, gonna, I'm conscious of time, Chris, I'm sorry. But I'll, I'll no, 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 it's, a, it's important that you do that. Um, just to say, uh, so um, for me, um, all good organisations have what they're called golden threads, and um, culture is is a huge golden thread throughout any organisation. Um, and I think you've rightly identified the challenges are um, how do we get staff that are representative and can go travel the journey through the police and deliver the service that our communities need because that's a direct reflection of trust and confidence in those communities. And a lot of these communities are not adverse to law and order. Uh, they're adverse to the way they're being treated. Uh, so it's really important that our culture as an organisation is um, where it needs to be. Uh, so I really w welcome the race action plan. Uh, there are some questions I just need to ask around it a little bit, please. Um, so the race action plan being embedded across the wider organisation as part of the work to build an institute that is truly r racist. How are you doing that? How are you making sure that this reaches the very parts that it needs to reach? Um, well, first and foremost, by holding holding my um, work stream leads um, to account. Mm. But wider than that, I mean, uh, the, the, the scope that my command has, mm. bearing in mind I have command of the city, the county, operational support, contact management, and the prevention hub, mm. gives me access to quite a significant number of people that have got their hand on the tiller. Mm. A significant number of our workforce sit under, under my command, and as a result of that, it becomes a standing item. Mm. We don't allow it to become this bit part uh, element that we lift off the shelf when we want to talk about it. It becomes a part of everyday business, Commissioner. Mm. We talk about it every day in, in our briefings. We talk about it in the business. I think that if I was to provide some tangible evidence as to how it has become daily business is when I chair the powers board and I see the amount of stop and search and the disproportionate disproportionality levels dropping, mm. but our positive outcome levels rising and mm. the amount of complaints reducing. Um, shows to me that we are starting to get this into the everyday psyche for the practitioners, making sure that that black history training is completed by everyone so that they understand the why. Mm. So it isn't a case of it's my responsibility or it's the chief's responsibility, it's everyone's responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's making sure that through everyday business, people recognise that when they are stopping vehicles under the powers of 163, they're proportionate, they're legal, appropriate, they're necessary. They're recognising that actually, like the race action plan, making sure that we are free from unconscious bias in our decision making as commanders, whether it's firearms, public order, whether it's everyday spontaneous decisions. It is a massive bit of work, but I do think that we are starting to crack the surface and, and, and actually mm. penetrate below. Okay. I think one of the things you can see within the organisation is there's much more conversation, talk about it, and understanding. So, mm. uh, so Kesha just talked about the. Uh, Black history training. Part of that is, you know, is encouraging those conversations mm. for people to understand what's happened in the past and what their role is moving forward. So, I, you know, it's we're not complacent by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. But what I think we're in a position now where the culture is definitely more open, understands some of the issues, and you know, and looking to move forward as opposed mm. to sort of denial and, and everything being mm. sort of hidden below the surface. And I think some of that will be reflected in some of the work Catherine does mm. in terms of actually people now challenging and being more mm. willing to challenge mm. so we're still on a journey but uh, i think there's, there's some definitely green shoots there yeah can, uh, point to. right that's good um how is it being applied in promotion boards this has always been a challenge um and it's really important that our senior officers reflect our communities as much as our pc on the street um so how are we going to apply that and make sure that we get diverse uh, leadership teams um, well, I can give you an answer and I'm sure the Chief will give you one and hopefully the, um, the video doesn't go out before the end of the promotion process, but it's a part of, and it has been a part of most promotion processes, if, if in, in fact, if, uh, most of them around presentations. And I think some of the most senior officers have been tested on it in their, in their presentations as well. Um, so it's been used not only in terms of promotion processes, but it's been used in terms of uh, career conversation objectives. Um, we are holding people to account. We're looking at outliers, so in terms of our performance data and seeing what, what's occurring on the streets. So we're making sure that it becomes a part of everyday business so people don't see it as a taboo. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm also cognizant that our representation is, isn't anywhere near what it should be at senior levels, and I'm sure the Chief would agree with, with me on that. Um, and this, this work stream or, the, or this overarching programme 
is is actually designed about changing the culture, making making it more acceptable to talk about mm -hmm. and be proud of who you are, mm -hmm. making it more acceptable to feel that you belong in this service because mm -hmm. the journey isn't easy as someone of colour. But also, I've seen the uncomfortable conversations you have to have someone when they don't want to talk to you about mm -hmm. these particular challenges. So I'm cognizant of the challenge on both sides of the fence. Mm -hmm. What we need to make sure is that we... Uh, we effectively get all matters of culture, to use your phrase, mm -hmm. embedded into everyday business, mm -hmm. that it becomes fluid, um, that we are representative of our communities, that we do, if we don't get people that are going to come to join us to be officers with us, they're still allies, they're still volunteering, they're still supporting, they're still talking, they're still engaging. Mm -hmm. And that's the success for me uh, as a senior officer is when we know that we can pick the phone up to people who can help us in policing matters, but they don't necessarily need to be wearing the uniform, mm -hmm. but they recognise that we are trusted friends. Um, but it is it is something which has been a taboo in the police service for far too long, and we I feel that we are making sure that it is a mm -hmm. critical part of everyday conversations in business. Mm -hmm. I think another element as well, so to obviously we will test it in the promotion processes, but it's also about supporting those individuals who are applying for the promotion processes to make them feel that they are mm -hmm. confident to you know to take on that challenge so we work with the bpa around identifying individuals mm -hmm. who are eligible for promotion um, and then looking to how we can support them in that process to mm -hmm. give them the best chance to uh, to be successful okay um is there a clear communication strategy to support and underpin the work that you're doing i i, I hope i've just shown you your commission and, and, and if and mm -hmm. if and then um, mm -hmm. and through that there'll be various other things that we'll do so every work stream will have um uh, whether they're vlogs, whether they're newsletters. So, for instance, um, we, we, we often do newsletters and, and vlogs around mm. the Powers Board, for instance, mm. which factors into Workstream 2. Um, so we will make sure that we don't deal with it in, its, in, in just its simplicity. Mm. We will pick it out from, uh, from the various areas. So mm. there'll be Workstream leads doing uh, wider culture retention pieces to mm. camera, but the race action plan will be the thread that runs through that. You know, whether we talk about powers and our use of force, the race action plan will be a thread that runs throughout that. So much like Vogue, my ambition is to get it so that it isn't an off-the-shelf product. It's just everyday business mm -hmm. as to how we tackle challenges. Okay, and I know you've touched on it, but aside from independent uh, sort of like scrutiny panels, um, what stakeholder engagement and quality discussion is being planned um, or taking place with black communities who are most likely to come in contact with the criminal justice system? Um, well, the, the the first and probably one of the most important moves for us was to um, seek the Strategic Race Action Plan coordinator, which which we did successfully through Jerome Edwards, who brought a new dimension, a new uh, a new set of understanding from from not being from a police background. Um, this this is a standing agenda item, be that with the ICSP or whether from with the IAG. So, mm -hmm. I, ironically, this morning. I chaired the Powers Board and Michael Henry, who mm. is the Black Communities IAG sub, uh, um, lead, attended that meeting mm -hmm. to come in to see what we talk about in regards to our data, in regards to the, the conversation. So mm. again, going back to that running thread conversation, I invite them in. We, we often have some really challenging and robust conversations. Mm -hmm. When we declared a, a critical incident around Operation Dove, one of the first things that I did as the gold commander on that job was mm. to... Um, speak with the IAG and ICSP leads mm. immediately, which shows that we are taking this area of business really seriously mm. and that we do communicate and collaborate. Mm. Mm. No, that's that, that's really good. I, I'm really warm to this um, and um, I'm really pleased that you're talking in the sense of it's okay to talk about this and if it's not right, let's try and fix it because if we're not prepared to have conversations about it, we can't move it forward. Yeah. Um, so the conversations we're having now I think is a real big step in that move to making Nottinghamshire Police more representative and giving the communities that we serve a lot more confidence in us. Yeah. Um, as you say, the fact that we're actually talking to elements of the community who are coming in here as volunteers and having that relationship with the police, it takes down that barrier a little bit uh, and it means as well they can come to you and say, I do have a problem mm -hmm. and this is what's happened and it can be looked at. So um, I really warm to that, um, and obviously there is a long way to go, um, but I think that um, what you've uh, sort of presented is really positive. Thank you. So I thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So um, is there anybody else would like to make a comment or yeah, add you. anything further to that? At this point? I think, Commissioner, it would be good mm. to talk to um, Sukesh and the leads in relation to the, the performance 
metrics that sit behind yeah, it and the measures of, of success. And I think you talked about feedback from community groups. Um, but I think we'd be interested in exit interviews of, in terms yes. of retention. Yes. Um, and, and, and other sort of indicators in relation to, is it making a difference? Are people feeling different? Um, whether they're within the workforce or members of communities, I think yeah. it would be useful to see if we could have a conversation. Oh, most definitely, and what we're also doing is we're also doing stay interviews as well, so people that we actually understand why people want to stay. Yes. So you're not just looking at why they want to go, why do they want to stay, so we can try and really sort of consider the, the bigger picture. So all of that data, you know, and uh, we are really working hard to try and understand that. Mm. As Sue has identified, the retention bit, once we, you know, that's... For me, if we attract people within the organisation and then they feel they need to leave is probably worse than never attracting them in the first place. So yeah. really that's you know why we recognise we have to really work hard at that. And that will help us understand some of the uh, issues and challenges that uh, colleagues face. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Well, uh, are you having to... Uh, I, 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 could, I could stay for the... Uh, okay. The motivation. Would you be right to pass the mic oh, on to so. Catherine? Is that right? Oh, thank you. <laughs> right okay um so um obviously now we're obviously going to uh, have a presentation from uh, superintendent catherine craner uh, professional standards uh, and integrity update so over to you yes apologies there isn't a presentation verbal, verbal update so i thought if that, it might be helpful for you um just a bit of an overview of the department mm -hmm. um uh, a couple of stats and some next steps so yeah my team uh, deals with public complaints misconduct um, we look at counter corruption and uh, I have the betting unit um, uh, within my department as well. We also have a role to play in dealing with incidents where members of the public have been killed or seriously injured uh, whilst in custody or otherwise when they've been in contact with the police, so we call that a DSI. And we work closely with the IEOPC in relation to that. Um, it's not where there's been any kind of conduct or failing, but it's about providing an account and, and transparency to the, to the family or the individual in question. Um, within the department, then there's myself as a superintendent, I have a, a DCI, Gareth Harding, two inspectors, one has oversight of our complaints and misconduct um, departments and uh, the other leads around counter corruption. Um, I also have a, a false betting manager. Um, so for complaints then um, uh, and misconduct, so we've got um, two DSs on the misconduct side, 14 investigators, so we have a mixture of detectives, police constable uh, and staff investigators as well. Um, uh, they actually have a role to play investigating some of our complaints as well as the misconduct side uh, and they lead on the DSI investigations with the IOPC. Um, complaints handling team then, I've got a, currently the establishment is a sergeant um, with the permission of the chief officer team I've also got a temporary sergeant in there for six months. Um, there's a sig significant volume of work that comes into that team, um, as I've kind of touched on in the numbers. Um, and um, we just want to make sure all our processes and procedures are um, as, as well as they can be. We've had a change round of how that team works in the last six months, um, which I'll just touch on in a second. So I felt it was really important to kind of give some support to that team, make sure we're doing that quality assurance. Uh, and getting that right. Obviously we recognise that not only is someone reporting that they've, um, uh, they've, they've received a service that they haven't been satisfied with uh, from a member of our police service, of course uh, we have a role to play um, in building their trust and confidence as well um, as a PSD. Um, within the um, complaints handling then there's five police staff um, customer complaints officers and there's two administrators as well so it's a relatively small team so yeah, they deal with the public complaints um, and um, they, they, they deal with appropriate um, and wherever possible to deal with as quickly as possible, proportionately, um, to get the outcome, to understand what it is the public would like to do to resolve the issue. So actually about 70 to 80% of the public complaints uh, that we receive are dealt with informally. So that means that we log them, we don't record them under Schedule 3. Um, the officer or staff member is made aware of the complaints uh, and we look to resolve those within the wishes of the complainant. So the, the benefit of that is that we can do that more quickly um, and we've got a range of things that we can talk to the complainant about uh, of what it is. It might be that they want an update on a, a case, it might be that they want some contact or, or it might be that they feel the officer um, should receive some learning or, or, or staff should receive some learning 
uh, and we certainly use learning by reflection so we'll make sure the line manager is aware uh, and to pass that learning on and for uh, many members of the public that's what they want from us and that's what we provide for them um, and that's in line with national figures so about 75 percent to be dealt with outside of schedule three if they're not happy with that though they do have the um the option of asking us to record that complaint which we will do um, and that then gives them a, um, a, a right to review as well, which is where your office comes in. They you would uh, do the majority of those um, with a view to looking at whether we've been reasonable and proportionate in our lines of inquiry um, and answered really the, the allegations that or the dis dissatisfaction that they have got, whether we have um, kind of dealt with it appropriately. So we have recently changed the role of the complaint handlers, so they don't... Um, just then deal with those outside of Schedule 3 complaints, actually they deal with someone then asking for it to be recorded, so it's about constructing a letter that sets out the allegations, that sets out what inquiries we've done, what we could have done, um, but haven't uh, for various reasons, uh, and then what the outcome is. Um, so we've asked more of them, um, but we, we felt that was really important to uh, focus our investigators on the, the um, either the con um, complaint investigations or the conduct matters. So it's about using the right people with the right skills um, to be as efficient as we can. But that's one of the reasons why we brought in a temporary sergeant to make sure we're getting that quality. Uh, and obviously we're really keen and continue to work with the OPCC to look at actually if we have had a review um, uh, upheld that we take the learning ourselves about well, what, what did we not do as well as we could have done in, in relation to that, uh, for that complainant. So to give an idea of numbers then, so in 12 months then we've had um, 1,526 complaints. Um, so that was only a 1.4% increase on the previous year. So we've seen a real um, significant increase since, um, uh, since kind of 2021, uh, but stabilised over that last year. So. Um, we've got no reason to think that those numbers would change drastically at this point. Um, the, um, you know, whether that was around rules and regulations changing and, um, uh, and members of the public kind of um, feeling more empowered to, to contact the police to make their complaints. Um, but I, either, either way, it's something that we can respond to and, and we continue to. Um, when we have recorded under Schedule 3, so that's the uh, where either the individual has asked us to or by the circumstances it's the most appropriate thing to do, we can look at that then other than by investigation or by investigation and what we found is that uh, just over 60% of those, the service was found to be acceptable. Um, so I think that's a, a positive, that shows that we are, um, firstly it shows we are uh, open to kind of say when we've got it wrong but actually what we're finding um, is that um, you know more often than not we are giving it an acceptable service and we'll make reasonable inquiries to get to the bottom of that. Body one video has been invaluable to our departments particularly if we're looking at a use of force complaint for example and those are the kind of inquiries that we will do um, but as I say we are looking um, wherever possible to share learning more widely we do look at uh, whether we've got um, repeat people being complained about. So obviously, we'll take that into consideration when we're making our decision about what what we would do. Um, and it might be that you know someone ha is coming on our radar, not ever reaching the level of conduct, but this is some preventative work that we can do to reduce uh, you know the, the impact, reduce further future complaints, uh, but also make sure they're absolutely clear on the expectations. Um, and what it is that members of the public are complaining about in relation to them. Mm -hmm. um, we've got many different methods of people to communicate their complaints to us. Obviously, that's really important. So single online home, um, they can phone us still online, um, they can write a letter to us. Uh, but you know, one of the things that we're just looking at at the moment is just to be absolutely sure that we are accessible um, as we can be, you know, really mindful of the Equality Act. Um, and that there's nothing else that, that we're missing either when they make that complaint or actually when we continue to engage with them after mm. that. Within that department, you know, we've got our own uh, focus on, on timeliness. Um, we have seen a, a slight decline in the number of days it takes us to contact the complainant recently. That was reflected in the IOPC annual statistics. That isn't wildly out from the, uh, the national picture, but it was a reduction on our own. 
that will be attributable to the fact that we've actually changed the way that that, that team works. When we do make contact, it is always meaningful contact, so it isn't um, just a response via email, for example, it will be in the first instance, where possible, will be a phone conversation, and it will be from the person who that member of the public is then going to have to resolve their complaint. So, um, but we, you know, we're, we're mindful of those um, figures and we're just looking at those. Um, and we're also looking at the time it takes us to resolve and whether um, that's, that has um, declined slightly as well, whether that's any kind of admin function around ticking boxes or whether actually we have seen a, a decline as something that the team are focusing on. Um, we do work with the OPCC to make sure, again, that we're taking learning as a department. Um, if, we're, if we're passing it out, we, we're happy to receive it as well. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that we really need to focus on is that wider learning for the workforce. So we really recognise that we've got a role to play in prevention, not just about uh, the, the conduct. Um, we, you know, we've got a role to play set, setting the standards, uh, looking at that culture. So that might be, for example, um, uh, if we look at the, the, the allegations that people make, they get categorised under the IOPC categories. Um, investigation with features as a theme in there. So well, we know that we've got op catalyst and actually we've got a wealth of information about people who've had a complaint from a member of the public. It might be very low level, um, but if it relates to investigation, actually have we got a role to play? Well, we do have a role to play and we see we've got a role to play in actually saying to the lead uh, for investigation, you know, why don't you start with this team or this individual to look to understand um, how we can um, prevent uh, any ongoing complaints. Um, but also um, in terms of speaking to heads of department, particularly when we look at incivility, we have seen um, a, a small increase in terms of volume of incivility. It's very low in terms of the overall volume, but actually if we were going to say to line managers or heads of department, you know, these are individuals we think you should be paying some attention to then we, you know we see that we have a role to to play in that or have we got particular officers and teams with just a volume of complaints so that data side of it is um, is really important from us and then working with um, heads of department to kind of come at this from from any angle we can either to uh, as I say reduce complaints prevent uh, a future dissatisfaction or even conduct um, so um, when I talk about the themes, then the, the overwhelming number of complaints um, is about delivery of duties and services. So that's 54% of all of the complaints that we get. That's in line with the national picture. Um, and within that, when it's broken down further, it's about general level of service and then police action, following contact and then decisions. So fourth highest is unprofessional attitude and disrespect followed by impolite and intolerant language. So, um, as I say, the, the volume decreases significantly, but um, um, very similar to last year in terms of what it is that people are wanting to complain about. Um, when we look at um, the conduct side of it, um, so a very small percentage of those, so 3% of complaints um, in, during that 12-month period, they were dealt with subject to special procedures, so they're the most serious, so that's either um, an indication of a criminal offence or that there has been a conduct matter. So a really small proportion of what comes in um, actually then leads either on to a criminal investigation or a conduct investigation. Um, so we do use suspensions. We have increased uh, the number of suspensions probably from the same time. Um, last year, um, we always consider whether it's the right thing to do to uh, retain the individual in the organisation, but really mindful of public perception um, uh, as well, all of those are authorised by the DCC and reviewed by him every month. So, um, you know, we, we kind of give that, um, we, we recognise it has a significant impact on the individual, but we also recognise that particularly where we've got victims that sit behind the conduct, then, um, you know, it can be the right thing to do. Um, uh, and we use restrictions um, appropriately. We recognise that can sometimes have an impact as well on the delivery at the front end. So again, we work locally uh, with Mr. Verma and um, the commanders to make sure that actually we, um, we, we really consider what the allegation is and then what the most appropriate risk, uh, restriction might be for that individual um, so that they can be utilised effectively and we can still continue to deliver that service. Um, the investigation officer will 
uh, consult with sub subject matter experts whilst they're doing their investigation and gathering the information. So that's um, you know reasonably new and, and will be triggered by um, conversations around the race action plan, around the violence against women and girls. Um, so it might be the uh, the BPA, it might be our neurodiversity um, network, um, association of Muslim police officers. They, you know, we've got some really good um, contacts with our networks to just give us that breadth of thinking and understanding, maybe, and so that we can take that into consideration. Um, in 2023, we had 18 gross misconduct hearings for officers. We have five hearings for staff and 15 misconduct meetings for officers. So. Um, your hearings are, are, are your gross, your 15 um, are uh, just at the level of misconduct. They do include officers and staff who have resigned or retired from the force um, and if it's a gross misconduct we will continue with the proceedings in relation to, to those, um, especially then if they are dismissed finding gross misconduct it's really important that they are placed on the College of Policing um, barred list so they cannot work in policing or any uh, law enforcement roles. Um, out of the 18 um, hearings and the gross misconduct hearings for police officers, all but one of those were accelerated case hearings. So they're fast track hearings essentially. That's when there is incontrovertible evidence of gross misconduct by the officer and those are all chaired by our chief constable. We are kind of above the national average in, in, in terms of that. We see that as a really effective way of um, you know, gathering sufficient evidence to get us to that threshold and then um, being, being robust uh, but being accountable but also being expeditious really in what that might be uh, and, and obviously those as I say, decisions made by our chief constable. Um, other than that though they will be chaired by our legally qualified, a lo legally qualified chair with a senior police officer, an independent panel member and at the end I'll just come to how that will change for us. Um, but that, that was uh, the position last year. Um, so yes, robust and pragmatic is the approach that we take in relation to our, our gross misconduct uh, cases where that's the right thing to do. Um, so on to the counter corruption unit then. So um, again, reasonably um, small unit. So we've got a detective um, sergeant there, three detective constables, two staff investigators, uh, an analyst and two researchers. We also have a corruption prevention officer in there. Um, their role is more broad than, than corruption, really. It's about complaints, conduct as well. Um, and their, their role um, is to proactively engage with members of the workforce, but also externally. And again, this feeds into either our, our engagement plan, but also our race action plan, um, where they are uh, linking in with um, the um, partners or third sector, where they can have most impact. So that might be, for example, um, women's aid, or it might be um, prostitution outreach workers or the Kaya project, to make sure that they understand, um, firstly, our standards, uh, and our expectations within our workforce, um, but also um, how to report any inappropriate behaviour or conduct and give them that reassurance that we will take that um, seriously. Um, so they deliver to our student officers, for example, um, as well as our newly qualified supervisors. Uh, and really that is ever evolving. So they will pick up on incidents either of conduct or complaints that come in um, or just issues that we foresee maybe through our national work um, where we can see a problem coming down the line and make sure everyone's really clear on standards expectations um, so that they don't fall foul of them. Um, but we've received some really positive feedback about the work that they've done and uh, you know how, how that has given that um, reassurance built that trust and confidence in, in the force and that we take it seriously but also as I say within the uh, professional standards unit um, and that kind of is an ever evolving um, piece of work. Um, but uh, the other thing that role that they would play is again looking at those themes that might come out internally um, and whether there is work that they can do maybe with a, a head of department um, to go in give a brief into a particular team if we just maybe have some concerns or see an emerging uh, picture of uh, of reporting. For example, again, it comes back to that um, preventative work. And um, so the the CCU then deal with proactively tackling corruption, investigating corruption as well against officers and staff. We work closely with the IOPC counter corruption unit. Uh, they uh, have an involvement to play in um, sensitive investigations, the investigation of those. Um, 
we have um, a, an anonymous um, internal line, which we've had for many years, it still exists, the Integrity Messenger, um, and that's recently gone to NAPS as well, um, so that it's kind of at the forefront of people. We do receive actually many, most of our internal complaints just through the direct email channels, so people are quite happy. That's the culture that we've been encouraging and you know, from, the, from the Chief's pledge is that you, in the Code of Ethics you take responsibility, ownership, you have courage. Uh, and so most of, uh, of what comes through to us internally comes through that channel, but it's obviously really important that we have a, an, an anonymous uh, system. Um, and um, we also have Crime Stoppers, so that's a national, nationally run Crime Stoppers um, uh, reporting line. And I think the real benefit of that is that um, the public have faith in Crime Stoppers. It's always been anonymous, it continues to be anonymous. And they know that we just cannot um, kind of get that uh, detail, no matter how much um, we might see the value of doing that. Um, so it gives a flavour there in terms of um, from the 1st of April 23 to the 31st of January 24, we had 27 Crime Stoppers reports disseminated. And they had a relaunch in September where it did go nationally. We had already adopted it. Um, and so I think it'd be important just to keep an eye on that. Um, and see, but kind of give some reassurance that uh, the public are uh, confident to report things uh, through us. And for the Integrity Messenger, again, we've only got from September 23, so we moved on to a, a slightly new system, um, a reporting system, um, sorry, a recording system, where we've recorded 98 Integrity Messengers. Um, we review and receive those um, every day and look at, actually, is this a performance matter that the line manager might be, need to be made aware of, or is there a conduct matter um, that we need to do? Um, so yeah, I think positive that people feel comfortable in uh, in reporting. Um, our CCU do proactive work as well, so they will use um, a number of tools to, uh, to to review things either overtly or covertly. That might be telecoms and IT systems. Um, it might be monitoring of officers if there's any uh, suspected risk to the organisation. Uh, and, and also that wider linking with the workforce. We do use drug and alcohol testing in line with the national guidance. Um, so we have done 21 random tests and six with cause tests in the last past 12 months. So, um, you know, with cause, with a piece of intelligence that we want to um, kind of test the, um, the officer or staff. Uh, we have a strategic threat assessment for the CCU that uh, works closely with the National Strategic um, Threat Assessment and we use our own stats figures uh, to understand what our own priorities are within the CCU to focus our work. Um, so the ones for 23-24, and we're very close to having it refreshed uh, for, the, for the next year, are vulnerability, disclosure of information uh, and misuse of force systems. Um, the betting team then, mm -hmm. um, so force betting manager, um, and then I have uh, two um, senior betting assessors, 11 betting assessors and a betting administrator. So they do all of the betting for not only the police, uh, but also um, our um, contractors and uh, partnership workers. Um, they'll look at enhanced level of clearance, so that might be um, you know, the security clearance, the management betting, uh, and all the renewals and the aftercare as well. Um, in terms of a, a, a kind of idea of numbers, it's a very busy team. So in 2023, they've received and completed over 3,000 uh, reviews. And actually, into 24, it looks like those numbers will be higher. Work really closely with people services. We know that we are the key enabler for the force to recruit uh, and for people to move around the force and also for partners as well. Um, so that's new starters, we have internal moves, we've got annual assessments, change of circumstances uh, as well within that. We played our part in the historic data wash, um, that was a national programme where we checked all serving officers and staff against the police national database um, to see if there was any intelligence that caused us any concern and required any re-vetting. Um, that was a big piece of work for the department um, and it, there is some suggestion that that might in some form um, be repeated, but at this time there's no uh, detail of what that might might look like. Um, the betting APP is going to be refreshed at some point in 2024. It's been put back um, slightly, so um, best guess at the moment is at the end of the year. The biggest part of the change in that, and, and you'll obviously be 
uh, really mindful of the commentary um, around Wayne Cousins and the Angelini report is about an annual integrity and vetting review. So that's a, a robust way of just being really clear with the workforce about all of the expectations upon them, from the code of ethics through to change of circumstances, uh, reporting of business interests, for example, um, and, and really just reminding them that vetting is incredibly important um, within our force. Um, so um, we are, have started the work already on that to make sure we understand what that means for us um, and working closely with our enablers um, within force to, to make sure we can deliver that when the final version <coughs> is, um, is um, uh, produced. Um, and Andrew in the report as well, that gives recommendations. A lot of those are contained within the vetting APP, um, but our force vetting manager um, has got links nationally to look at what, what work has been done nationally and then we'll re-feed into uh, Mr Cooper's and the Assistant Competence Board to report back on what that means for the um, vetting department. Another change within the vetting APP is to identify posts where the um, employee works with other <coughs> people. That's a new, um, uh, a new kind of um, level, uh, it's not a new level of vetting, sorry, it's the same level of vetting but there's some enhanced checks. So we would want to check, for example, with a supervisor, ask them additional questions about the suitability of that um, individual. So that will be departments, the national um, proposal is, um, for example, working uh, in domestic abuse, child abuse, um, or school liaison, for example, and again, we'll wait for the final vetting APP to clarify that. Um, so there have been changes to the uh, police regulations, um, and the, the primary one of these is about the composition of the misconduct panel. So it removes the legally qualified chair and gives responsibility um, for chairing um, misconduct proceedings to chief officers. Um, uh, uh, and we have Mr. Hutchcombe in our force um, to deliver this. It creates a, a legal advisor role, he'll provide the advice, uh, and it requires two independent uh, plan panel members. So a lot of commentary in force about, or and, and with, with the, our key uh, partners within this about how we will do that, how we will have the right number of people, how we will have the capacity to be able to um, move hearings through as expeditiously as possible. Uh, we have a really important role to play within the race action plan, uh, and the DCI attends Mr Verma's uh, meetings to talk about that, understand disproportionality in complaints, and what that means to be, you know, what, what's the makeup of our complainants, but also the makeup of the officers being complained about and staff, and um, what does it mean within the misconduct world, um, and also vetting. So, again, have we got any disproportionality in any of those um, segments? Um, and that's a, a piece of work, as I say, that, that um, is ongoing. We feed into the race action plan. A key part of that is about how we um, enable some scrutiny of our decisions. Um, and kind of that, that challenge and feedback, whether that be internally, particularly from the, the Black Police Association, who work with closely on this, um, but also consider if there's any external opportunities as well. Um, so we know that we've got a huge part to play in the delivery of the, of the Chief's um, pledge to deliver the outstanding service. Obviously, trust and confidence for us is, is key for the communities and um, you know, a real priority for me to understand that we understand that we know where we fit into um, that and, and how we support the force in, in delivering that on behalf of the Chief. Great, thank you very much. Right, okay, um, I'm just going to ask you some questions around that and you've kind of, um, again, touched on a lot of, of some of the concerns or some of the questions that I need to ask. So obviously, uh, police integrity and professional standards. Um, we're at a time in policing where publicly that's been really, really challenged. Um, and uh, there are a lot of questions in the communities around police officers and um, are they uh, the appropriate people to be wearing that uniform? So um, publicly it's affected confidence quite, quite drastically. So it's really important that um, from yourselves we see a really robust response uh, in relation to um, integrity and professional standards. Um, it's obviously affected women and girls, minority communities you've already mentioned. Uh, obviously the, the, um, the time it takes as well for sort of like robust scrutiny of complaints and getting that through the system. Um, and obviously the, it's really important that we have oversight and scrutiny in, a, in a, again, a robust manner. 
in your view, uh, what is the most important areas for improvement? Um, the, the data uh, quality side in terms of us understanding what does it mean to be a complainant, uh, how quickly do we deal with and um, are they getting the outcome that they believe that they um, should have received. Um, that's um, kind of really important and then data quality around um, the disproportionality is a really significant part for us in the department at the moment. You mentioned um, that you know, Borg was on, on my list actually and I didn't mention it but you know we really recognise that police perpetrated domestic abuse is of significant concern. Um, we have a number of cases uh, where we can show that we are um, not only receiving reports internally from members of staff and from members of the public, but then we are dealing with those and continue to deal with those really robustly. You know, that's a really key part of, uh, of giving that trust and confidence. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, um, I, I suppose the vetting APP is, is really a priority for me as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really important that we show we've got those high standards. Um, there's um, a, a kind of proposals in there around transferees. We've already got those in our in place. We know that that's a real concern for the public about um, the standards um, of, of, of staff and officers that we have in the workforce, and that we are kind of have that high bar. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we've already, as I say, got got in place. That's uh, that continues to be important for us. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, previous accountability boards have uh, made reference to a loss of some of the experienced staff in PSD. Um, what's, what sort of actions have you taken to sort of mitigate that risk? Um, so I've only been in PSD for a couple of months. Mm. Um, we have um, only a handful of vacancies at the moment. We are a small department, um, but actually since, it, since I'm, uh, I've landed, we have had a couple of internal moves. Um, for police staff, it's really important and really healthy that they can see opportunities in other parts of the force. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, we always have a really good uh, number of people applying to work within professional standards. Um, so um, our DCI has recently been confirmed in post. Mm -hmm. um, so it gives some kind of, um, hopefully I recognise I'm new into the department, but it gives hopefully some consistency and, and longevity. But mm -hmm. it's not something that... I see as a challenge for us at this time. Okay. There's, there's always a balance, isn't there, between consistency and getting mm -hmm. new people in. And we've talked earlier around the you know, section plan some of that uh, representation, and we're working hard in relation to that because I think probably up to about a year ago, PSD was a, a department where there was very little representation mm -hmm. from some of, some, uh, of the underrepresented groups. So there's always a balance, but what we will always make sure that we do is that we have that, Catherine's already mentioned it, that consistency and that uh, expertise within there that. We know, we, we know the people in there are able to deal with what they need to deal with. New people will come in, but they'll always be supported by somebody who understands the regulations mm -hmm. and the approach. So uh, we're always back trying to balance that to try and you know maximise both opportunities <coughs> around consistency, mm -hmm. but also a different perspective, which I think, you know, as we went articulating, what that's the difference, isn't it, over the last probably two years. That we've really had to challenge ourselves to how we've done things previously. You know, we talked about the additional vetting that we've done and the work we've done around there, you know, really looking and reflecting inwards as to you know how good are we actually at addressing some of the concerns about mm. individuals within our organisation. Okay, thank you. Okay, does the force have any local findings to share with the Historic Data Watch uh, national programme? I was going to say, I, yeah, I'll, just, I'll just take it to start. We did do an update at the um, a couple of accountability boards ago, which was the sort of conclusion of the data wash. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. I can't remember those at the top of my head, but I can certainly share those with you. Mm -hmm. But what I can say is, from from what we got from there, there was no additional concerns. From anything we did, there was nothing that causes any concerns, mm -hmm. either in terms of individuals or that our processes weren't but working right, and we weren't getting people picking up concerns where they existed. Okay. I don't know if there's anything else you need to add. Mm -hmm. No, that that. Okay, there's a bit more on it as well. Is the force sufficiently resourced to deliver the additional vetting data wash requirements that they re are required on a national basis? Um, and also, what impact have these requirements had on a routine vetting activity and maybe some backlogs and delays? So at the moment, we've not been made aware that there is a, what a request might be mm. for a future historical data wash. Mm. Um, we did obviously prioritise it. It was really important that we um, met with the times that were given to us um, nationally, mm. and we did that. 
Um, it did have an impact on the team. It's a bit <coughs> relatively small team, but it was an important piece of work. Um, I do keep track of the um, of the outstanding. As I say, we, we make sure we prioritise um, within the outstanding demand, um, and I can see that demand coming down. So um, you know, we um, I don't have any concerns at the moment, and obviously linking closely with the chief team, and we can see uh, what might what might come. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, and also, uh, we, we were talking about prevention, uh, and it applies as much to PSD as any other department, really. Um, how is the proactive work of PSD helping to drive improvements in public trust and confidence in Nottinghamshire? Um, so, I think hopefully you've got a flavour of the work that the prevention officer is doing, which has been you know, a real change, I think, for PSD. Um, they're well embedded now and they've got those connections and they've been referred on through uh, uh, you know, through other partners. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's definitely some proactive work. Internally, again, we're, we're taking those opportunities to um, engage with the workforce to set some expectations and around particular key areas um, and to make sure that you know they aren't uh, falling uh, falling foul of that. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, that, that work that I talked about where we are using the information and the data that we have to work with heads of department um, to talk about either conduct issues or, um, or complaints um, to look to see where we can prevent in the future and learn from our mistakes. We get learning from many different routes and I go to the, um, the, the learning uh, ethics and integrity board that Mr Hooks chairs where um, you know, this is what's asked of me, so that might be from the IOPC in a, in a DSI investigation for example, it might be some organisational learning, um, it might be individual learning uh, and yes absolutely I have a really important role in disseminating that throughout the organisation um, but also how we use the media to, you know, to build that trust and confidence in the work that we're doing. Okay, thank you for that. Are there any further questions? No. no? Okay. Is there anything further you'd like to add? No, thank you. No. So I will now close uh, the public agenda. Um, uh, sorry, I won't close the public agenda. Sorry, got another uh, part of the agenda, but just to close the part on professional standards and integrity update. So thank you, Superintendent Kathleen. I much appreciate it. Okay. So uh, the next item is an update uh, uh, on the College of Policing review. Uh, into the Nottinghamshire's handling of the Valdo Calicane case, and uh, Michelle Butchley is going yeah. to give that verbal review. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner, well, um, Catherine has already mentioned the, the work of the IOPC uh, for the public, that's the Independent Office of Police uh, Conduct, and um, the, they've got an investigation in relation to um, force handling of the case uh, ongoing at the moment, so that's very much a live investigation. Your predecessor commissioned the College of Policing Review, and so this is a standing item at the Accountability Board, just so the public can understand the pro progress with that. Mm -hmm. But as reported last time, the review at the moment is paused, um, so that the College of Policing can work with the uh, Independent Office of Police Conduct to understand where they are in the investigation and what review work can be done, if any, um, while the IOPC take primacy in relation to their investigation. So very little to report this time, mm -hmm. Commissioner. Okay, thank you for that update.